we're going to uh, take a look now at a new conversation, again, building up on many of the conversations we've had in the past in terms of understanding how it is that men can participate in the upliftment and elevation of women in the corporate space and understanding, most importantly, some of the strategies that can be implemented to help grow, improve on gender parity across the continent. With that said, allow me to warmly welcome our panelists who will join us on stage. The AV will give us insight into their background, but Bafana Kumalo from Sonke Gender Justice, Ngwaba Ndiweni, who's from PwC, Mafake Mariletze from Avon, and Charmaine Mabuza from Zamani Holdings will all join me on stage for an enlightening panel discussion. Bafana Kumalo is a senior strategic advisor and co-founder at Sonke Gender Justice. He has a long and accomplished track record in the NGO sector and was senior gender technical advisory for Engender Health South Africa between 2012 and 2013. Ngabandiweni, or Q, is a director at PwC. He has worked across the capital markets assurance businesses of PwC both in South Africa and in the United Kingdom and is Head of Transformation in South Africa for the assurance business. Mafahle Mareletsi is Group Vice President TMEA and General Manager for Avon. He is extremely passionate about empowering women to achieve financial autonomy and ensuring a safer environment for women and girls. Charmaine Mabuza is the co-founder and group CEO of Zamani Holdings. This award-winning powerhouse rose to the top while juggling life as an entrepreneur after school. In 2008, she launched Zamani, a holding company for various independent companies, including Ituba, the national lottery operator. Level three applause for my panelists, please, ladies and gentlemen. There we go. Thank you very much to our panelists for joining us and for sharing insight with us. And I guess as we peel back at the various layers of this conversation, as mentioned, we'll certainly be taking a look at a reflective view of understanding how it is that we've changed the landscape in terms of incorporating more women within the uh, gender agenda and men participating in that regard. And of course, unfolding and unpacking on some of the strategies that are implemented within the corporate companies that you work for. And I guess the majority of the people on the panel, of course, being men, Charmaine is joining us as a woman just for control, to make sure that there is <laughs> order and structure to this conversation. But, but Bafana, I'd like to start off with you to get some insight into some of the work that you've done. We have reflected on a decade that has gone by. We're still working towards our goals through Agenda 2063 in terms of attaining levels of increased gender parity within the African continent. But when you look back, in terms of SA specifically in the last 10 years, and in comparison to our counterparts on the continent, have we managed to make any pro progress? Thank you very much. I think that it's a mixed um, bag. We've made some strides in terms of policies. I think when we started, you'll recall in 94, there were fewer women in parliament, for instance, less than 30%. That increased somewhat to just over 40%. Um, as the years progressed. Uh, but as fate would have it, we also regressed in the last administration. The numbers dropped. We had fewer cabinet ministers who were women. In the current administration, I'm glad to say we have 50% women, which is a very positive move. Uh, possibly it should have been 60% given that women are majority. But in the pri private space, I think there's still a lot of work to be done. If one look at the companies in the JSE, very few of them are run by women CEOs. Very few women are chairpersons of the boards. Mm. And so we still need to do a lot of work in that regard. And that does call on a multi-pronged approach in order to make sure that we bring more women uh, in terms of their level of participation there. Charmaine, I'd like to throw this one at you and also have you uh, share your thoughts and opinions with us as a representative of PwC, a company which in itself has actually prioritized uh, gender parity and, of course, the advancement of women within corporate spaces. But Charmaine, from your personal point of view, uh, when we talk about these elements that allow us to progress and at the same time regress, clearly it means that there's a disconnect in terms of the elements on the ground to encourage more women to be leaders in the corporate space. Where are we missing the dots? Thank you, Gugu. I'm being a little today. 
It's true, we've really regressed when it comes to uh, equalization, especially in the corporate space. And largely because we talk about these things in policy, but action and monitoring is almost non-existent. And there's no uh, repercussions or consequences if corporates do not meet the so-called targets. And also there's a lack of consciousness in our leadership in the boardrooms, like the chairpersons and board members. You will know that in, there is a number of a, a large number in middle management when it comes to leadership in women, but leadership itself is almost non-existent. That you see women taking their place on the table when it comes to these matters. It's a great pity because we have regressed, and I think the question and the challenge is around these men who are here and ourselves who are able to make things happen. What are we doing about it? Ngaba, let's get you in this. You've been at PwC for well over 10 years, if I'm not mistaken. 16. You'll see, excuse me? 16. 16. So wow. the face is a bit deceiving. <laughs> Your CEO is also one of those critical leaders who has not only implemented policies in terms of gender parity, but has also contributed to a book, Equal But Different, which is written by one of our earlier pan panelists earlier this morning, Dr. Judy Gamini. Let's get some insight as to internally, in terms of what PwC is doing policy-wise that is implemented in its strategy that has led to these positive results and outcomes? So from a PwC perspective, we realized many years ago that if you look at the pace of making gender equality real, it wasn't quick enough. Um, we saw that as an organization, we're absorbing, call it a 50-50 men to women rate. But as you look at it from a leadership perspective, we weren't getting the traction. And there's various reasons for that. But um, most of how we're starting to challenge ourselves today is to say the policy is there, the strategy is there, the CEO has rubber stamped it, we signed up for he for she, but it's got to go beyond that, right? And it goes beyond that on the day-to-day -day basis. You talk about power with purpose, and the question we continue to ask ourselves is you can hit the target, <coughs> right, and bring inclusion into the business but are you really allowing the women to have influence in the organization? So mm. influence talks to um, what roles are you actually giving them? Are you giving them meaningful roles or just roles that only look at, call it staff matters? So it's really, call it changing that paradigm shift. And to use a simple example, we've spoke, speakers have spoken this morning around a 250 year journey to get there, yeah. right? And what that really means is We've allowed ourselves to say we're going to go at a snail's pace to get there. Mm -hmm. And in the mind of a snail, a snail thinks it's really moving and it's motoring. But the reality is the snail is going slowly. And the 250-year journey means the parents that are yet to be born are actually not also going to experience equality. So in our minds, we want to fast track that pace. And we certainly have to do it on a day-to-day basis and make sure that every man in the organization understands that it's his problem as well. Mm. And they have to be advocates for it. You've hit the nail on the head on an element that I do want us to touch on, and that goes to mentality. Because the truth is we can have all the paperwork that we want, we mm. can sign off on it, we can tick the boxes, but unless it actually speaks to the mentality of the male counterparts that are interacting with these females, then we're not going to see much of a change. Ngaba, Shamain, uh, and Mafaka, I also want you to come in in terms of some of the experience within your organizations that we can learn from in terms of adapting the male mentality to understand that the female gender agenda well, it's not a female gender agenda, if I throw a female <laughs> in there, but that the gender agenda is also a key priority for them as well. Ngaba, and then Shamena Mafake will come to you. So I didn't quite hear the question. So. How have you made it practical in terms of speaking to your male counterparts to say, Gugu might be going on maternity leave for nine months, but bear in mind she's still influential, she's still a leader, and she still needs to be acknowledged and groomed for further growth potential internally? So, so organization-wise, there's a simple concept of flexibility, right? That's really challenged us to say the way we did business yesterday can't be the way that we do business tomorrow. People have different needs, et cetera, et cetera. So that's helped to recalibrate how we think about bringing it to life um, on a more day-to-day -day basis. But I think the most challenging part is actually staring at your male counterparts, calling them out, and having the courage to do so in various meetings because when the boys or the men get together, right, um, there's certain comments that are made, and I think a few speakers touched on that, but it's, it's really around being honest around those conversations. Again, I think it goes just beyond the workplace to say when, when the fellas are having a bra, et cetera, et cetera, how do we um, raise those conversations there, 
right? And how bold are we with even our own families, never mind just work colleagues, to make sure that um, we're driving that process. We're quite happy um, when we reflect on our own mothers and we say as children they nurtured us so well and yet at the time of passing again we say eloquent words sure. about how they've carried on but we actually don't do that in, re in the real corporate life and, and celebrate them. Indeed. Charmaine, you wanted to add very briefly on that? Yes. But Bafan, uh, I feel like we've kept you quiet for too long, sorry. so I also want you fun, to fun, <laughs> pull you patient. into this one briefly. <laughs> I won't be long, but thank you. Yes, it's true. For some of us here, we are the leaders in our own organizations. We must practice what we pe yeah. pe preach. We must stand up for what we say. We must put our money where our mouth is. In other words, we must challenge ourselves. These interview panels must be made up of women. I talk about practical steps that we do. Those social clubs or forums within the organization, women must lead them. I mean, you often see that we're having talks, uh, drinks during five and six. That's where we are cooking. Mm. Why don't you have them at, uh, during the work time, during lunch time to accommodate women? There must be practical steps. Yeah. Even in terms of like, King 4, if you talk on a, a, a policy perspective, yes. King 4 talks about diversity, but really have we defined what diversity is, because it's a voluntary poly, uh, a good uh, governance code. We, we need to practicalize these things. You talk about BE, we spoke about it in the codes. It, it really now you can buy your status one if you've got money in terms of social responsibility programs. We've diluted the meaning of ownership of women and leadership of women in these codes. Indeed. Mafasha, I want to get you into the conversation as well. You are male and you're leading quite an influential organization that has women as its client base and customer base, women within its distribution network, and even, I understand, working within the manufacturing of cosmetics that is pushed forward here. Avon has also taken a critical role in trying to cultivate entrepreneurship and having more women come on board with a variety of hashtag initiatives that I understand you have in place. How have you made this practical? And also, you happen to be a man leading this kind of initiative. What is it for you that actually sparked the interest, the intrigue, and that works for you in terms of your leadership capabilities that can be shared with our other male counterparts by being a man keen on driving this focus on the gender agenda? Yeah, I mean, you know, I never thought I'd be called a male feminist. <laughs> quite an interesting <laughs> term. But I think just a bit of history about Avon. Um, you know, the beauty industry is a big industry. Globally, it's a $530 billion market. In, in rent terms, it beat 8 trillion rent. So it's a big market. But uh, when Avon Network was started, uh, the people who started realized that, you know, largely the consumers of the beauty industry are women. But women were just consumers. And the economic spectators were on the sidelines. Uh, and so they developed a model that said, how can we get women to actually not just be consumers, but to economically benefit from this, this industry. And hence, they started a model that said, we will involve women in the industry by ensuring that women become actually the sellers of the product that sell to other women. Uh, and by that then, they found that actually by letting women, giving them an opportunity to be beauty entrepreneurs, they were empowering them. Because the first step of women empowerment is financial independence. Uh, and that's how it became. And then eventually, Avon became the company for women. Uh, so it went from just being an external empowerment of women to how do we ensure that we live our purpose of saying we want to empower women. Mm -hmm. So internally women, Avon is actually a company for women. Uh, I'm, I'm really intrigued by that stat and figure that you've shared with us and perhaps you can also give us some insight as to whilst it is a company for women and they're participating economically, how many men do you have on board who assist in terms of mentorship, sponsorship uh, and even just additional support in trying to create awareness of Avon and the women who are economically emancipating themselves through this initiative? We actually have very few men because the majority of our people are women. Yeah. My boss is a woman. Our yeah. global executive is full of women. Uh, we are outnumbered as uh, uh, men leaders in our business. It's mostly women. And now it's for the women to actually do what is expected from men. They must do the mentorship. They've been empowered and they must empower other women. They mustn't be become queen bees who just want to be the, the, the only queen in the, amongst the boys. Uh, but we've, everyone has actually gone beyond a lot of what other companies have achieved. I do want to throw in another element which is very pertinent not only to the South African culture and environment but globally as well. And that's gender-based violence. 
we cannot ignore the fact that it's a critical issue that needs to be addressed society-wise, economically, and in terms of the political policies we have in place. It is high on the agenda. We cannot have men who are our sponsors and mentors outside of our homes, and yet when we return back, we are being beaten to a pulp and our livelihoods are at stake here. Baba Fana and to the gentleman on the board, before we actually come to you, Charmaine, how do we need to fix this in terms, again, speaking to the mindset of men, that there needs to be a sense of alliance in terms of how we support women within the workplace and in our domestic spaces? Well, thank you for that question. In fact, it uh, links up with what Charmaine said earlier, which I res it resonates with my ideas. I want to make an example with um, my own organization. <clears throat> I mean, one of the challenges we have in this country is that we have seg segregated chores and duties on the basis of gender. Care work is seen mainly as women's work, and all the innovative, adventurous exploits are seen as men's responsibilities. Now, where is the problem? That starts right in the home. You know, how we socialize our children. I mean, we grow up as men being told that caring for children is not our responsibility. So as, a, as my organization, we lobbied government for several years to say, at one level we are saying men are not responsible for their care work at home in taking care of their children, but at the same time we don't have policies that support that. Now women get four months of uh, uh, maternity leave, but what do men get who, have, uh, who are partners to these women in support for their children? So we lobbied then and said, look, let us create an, a policy environment where there is paternity leave. Now, by paternity leave, before you jump at me, we're not saying it's free time for men to watch TV, go and play golf, <laughs> and all of that. We mean taking responsibility to be there for your children in what yes. I call emotional investment. Yes. yes. Now, I'm glad to say that we have had some strides because government, as you will know, has signed a 10-day paternity leave. It's not enough, but we are starting somewhere. Mm -hmm. But we felt as a, my organization, we want really to lead from the front on this. We don't give men in my organization 10 days. We give them full month, mm. fully paid, but they know that their responsibility is there to support their partners. Yes. And we see men who play that role are not violent. They take care of their children, they respect their partners. So it changes the whole narrative around what it means to be a man. What are we doing in terms of PwC and Avon particularly, in terms of implementing this and focusing on that gender-based violence and again, speaking to the mindset and mentality of men? So to be honest, there's no specific instance that we've focused on it from the level of gender-based violence. But I think if you look at how we operate as an organization in terms of how we treat our people, um, just encouraging that equality and certainly um, not subscribing to, to a violent culture and, and, and trying to make sure that in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis at work, people don't feel um, that they're not in a safe space. I'll give you a, a simple example. It's probably not leaning towards gender-based violence, but just the safety of women. In instances where our teams are working pretty late, um, till one or two in the morning, we really encourage our male counterparts to say, do you know what, drive behind that lady. Make sure that she gets home before you have to do a U-turn or, or go um, to your own place. Perhaps something small, but something that really makes um, some of the women in our practice feel um, fairly safe. So I think in my mind, it's, it's really the small things that count and how we bring those to life every day. From Avon's point of view? Excuse me. Sorry, coming to okay. Mafake from Avon's point of view. You know, one of the unintended consequences of empowering women is that you actually encourage abuse against them. Mm. Because when women become empowered, Backlash. many of them, their partners become threatened. Mm. And Emasculated. Mm. Because now they see this woman is empowered, she's becoming independent, she's becoming assertive, uh, and then they feel quite threatened about it, and they start really, you know, um, committing um, violence against them. So what we do in terms of that, having realized that when women join our organization as of network sellers, they're actually encouraged to understand the signs of abuse, what is abuse, emotional, physical abuse, how to prevent it, and to speak out against it. So we run a campaign globally that's called Speak Out, uh, speak out Against Violence Against Women, and we encourage them to, you know, 
educate their communities about it. And we hold ceremonies where we, we like this one, where we have people coming to discuss specifically on issues of uh, violence against women. Indeed, I do want us to build up on some of the points that have been highlighted and coming back to get your feedback, Charmaine. But I do understand that there's some burning questions in the audience and we will have time just to take two. I understand that two questions have been allocated. If you could speedily make your way to the spotlight microphones, once you're there, we'll come back to get your feedback at the spotlight microphones. But Charmaine, I also want to get your feedback. You are in the fortunate position, unlike the majority of South African women, to be able to run an organization with your husband, including the foundation. So clearly that speaks to the kind of conversations uh, and interventions that need to take place here. Any learnings that we need to share with the Boyles Boys Club in terms of how to change their mindset and become more um, open to equality? Well, uh, I would like to address two things on the gender-based violence before I address it. This is a subject that is very close to my heart. My niece's murderer was convicted yesterday, Zolila Kumalo, which has really prompted us, as, it actually drove us, me in particular, to make sure that there's proper programs within the organizations that I run for, which I can share with you. But one thing what uh, one of the co-speakers has uh, raised is that uh, the more women have emerged, the more men feel mm. threatened, and then men cannot uh, address issues with us as women in our household. But that is something that I think is just an excuse. For many cases, yes, it's true that we've become very powerful in our own rights, and therefore men cannot deal with it. But we cannot make that an excuse. We need to stand up and say no at all times. But importantly, we in our own roles as leaders need to educate, as mothers as well, educate our boy child how to handle diversity and how to handle women. It's critically important. But importantly, I'm going to speak now as a, a mother and as a wife and having a business partner who's my husband as well. I think for me, the key thread there is about respect and allowing each other's opinions because in the boardroom, we are partners and we are head on. We leave our problems in the boardroom where we differ. And at home, I play the role of being a wife and a mother. I know how to differentiate those positions. And many a times, many people can't do that. I was about to throw that in there in terms of the cultural dynamics uh, and being cognizant of the continent that we're on, the various backgrounds that we have that influence our culture, our religion, and how we actually interact as couples, as mm. colleagues, mm. and of course as members. But we'll come back to that one in just a moment. I'd like us to take the questions very briefly. Ladies, you've got 30 seconds. I understand these are planned questions that were aligned. Um, so we'll only take two in the interest of time. We'll start, whoever's first at the mic, go ahead. The mic will be on, spotlight on you, and we'll address your question. You've Made it to the mic first. Please go ahead, Sis Nokolo. Hi, um, Noctula. Noctula, yes. Short Nox. Love your work. Um, thank you for having this panel. It's amazing. It's exciting, and to have the gentleman there. So I've got a few points to um, to on PWC. It it sounded like a cop out to ask a colleague to drive behind a woman so that she gets home safe. Mm. So what happens if I'm the wife and I'm waiting for my husband to get home and I've just had a baby? So I just think it's, a, it's an afterthought and it's not something that's been deliberated properly or, or provide a solution. Because a security company in your company could be paid to offer that for after hours work so that it's actually guaranteed, not a guy who says, hey, I've, I've got a wife. Just comment and also just to, it sounded like it's just a side thing. And on the gentleman of doing the 10 day um, paternity, amazing work. The one area that I find is a gap is that as women, we do inner work and mindfulness, consciousness on our roles as women at work and at home. What I'm finding is that we are very quick to say, educate a boy child. What is happening about organizations that are educating adults, grown up men who behave like children at home? We marry them. And you, 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 are, you are currently still doing amazing work. So we want to see organizations that are going to deliberate these things with men every day. And I love that you're educating them at Avon about abuse and consciousness of knowing verbal abuse and mental abuse and making me feel small. It's not questions, it's comments, but I'd like it. To, we want to see men actively yes. taking a role um, in our lives. Thank you so much, Noctula. We appreciate the passion that's been shared. If you could go away, go on with your quick fire question to ma'am. So the question that I ask is, quite often you see a woman business gets an opportunity by virtue of her being a woman, 
and the desperate need to sort of include women and allow for their excellence. So how do you strike the balance between allowing a woman to feel that she's got a certain position by virtue of her abilities and not by virtue of her being a woman? Fantastic. Thank you so much. Great question and one that can be uh, um, opened up and peeled back in terms of um, uh, ensuring that there's a, a great sense of in, uh, individuals being appointed to roles aside from their gender or their race as such. I think let's start off with that last question in terms of peeling back as to understanding how we educate our girl children to know that even if they get appointed to roles where there might be a policy and mandate to appoint a female, it goes beyond that. It's their skill and ability that needs to be acknowledged. Anyone keen to take that one very briefly? Shame? Y yes. I thought the men were going to participate here. <laughs> Naba, jump in there if you'd like. Yeah, sure. No, I think um, it's important that we, 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 we as women understand that if we are appointed to any position, it's not because of our gender, it's because of our skills and capability. And I think once we understand that, we ha must have that confidence uh, in performing that role to, its, uh, to our utmost best. And um, I know that we are often compared with our male counterparts. As somebody said, we've got to put in a lot more hard work for our positions to be had. But so be it, put in the hard work and get the job done and mm. prove that you are capable of doing it. And that's my take about it. There is no need to say there's a clash between our sexuality and our appointment because you can do both and do it well. I mean, you are what you are. Exactly. <laughs> now I'd like to come to you and building up on uh, Knox's question on Octula regarding the conflict that might arise in terms of uh, corporates, in terms of the policies you implement to have male colleagues support their female colleagues, but then that stirring the pot back at home in terms of domestic issues. Are there any other elements and avenues that we can look at? Or are there other alternatives that have been implemented by PwC? So I suppose one has to look at it in, in, in various factors, but one way to look at it is, is as follows. It, it goes without saying, and the stats are there to say, obviously women and children are the most vulnerable in our society. So anything that we can do just to make the place a little bit safer, um, it really goes a long way. I think there's many more things that we can do um, in terms of, 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 of creating spaces around that. Um, and it's, it's probably difficult to, to, to move the entire organization towards it. But if you think about what our values stand for, we've got five particular values. One of them is care, right? And through that value, whether it's being an advocate for an individual or really making them feel part of the team, even though they are of a different gender, goes a long way. And given that we, we challenge ourselves on this, it's also around when we do with particular clients, mm. um, starting to raise those conversations as well, because it's all good us trying to do it as an organization, but we get a lot of guidance and views from clients that are trying to do the, achieve the same objectives. So I think you've got to push the needle in so many different spheres, as yeah. opposed to just one, one area which might just create safety in our minds, but there's, there's many more legs to stand on. I think what's important is at least these conversations are taking place. We are engaging with the relevant stakeholders to find out what the solution is as and where we need to amend it. As we draw on our concluding remarks, I do want to build up on the second question that was asked by Noctula in terms of the conversations that take place. It seems a bit easy for us to be able to express some of these views here on this open platform, but the truth of the matter is when you're at the car wash, when you're at the golf course with the guys, when you're cutting your hair at the barber shop, there are conversations that make it uncomfortable that eh, eh, I won't be told by a woman, right? So that really does speak to how we need to communicate with our male counterparts in getting them on board. Mm -hmm. Bafana, I'd like to come to you as well as Mariletta to give us your closing thoughts in terms of the conversations that need to take place with men to make sure that they are fully on board in terms of supporting women in the emancipation in all aspects of their life. What is the one thing that if you could put on the agenda from a political point of view, an economic point of view, and social point of view that we need to leave here knowing today. Mafana and Mareletze, 30 seconds to you each. I think we need to emphasize socialization. I'm a firm believer that these things start at home. What are the values that we're inculcating in our children as we bring them up? We need to tell the boys. In fact, we need to stop. We spend a lot of time saying to women how to control themselves, their sexuality, what to wear in the public space instead of telling our boys that they must treat women with dignity. Yes. Yeah, so we need to change the narrative and focus on where the problem is and not focus on those that are compelled every day to have to protect themselves to becoming the, the center of the issue. 
we need to say to our boys, it does not mean you are a man when you are abusive, when you use violence against women. Men can be better than that. And we need to create that space right from the home. How do we ensure that men are able to communicate? Men need to be educated to understand that there's nothing wrong with being vulnerable. Mm. We are not always all powerful. There are moments when we are weak and it's not a sign of being a bad person. It's human and it's natural. So how do we nurture that component of femininity within us? I always say to people, men, we are fortunate we have the X and the Y chromosome. You know, so we need, we have a certain sense of femininity within us, inborn. How do we cultivate that and say, it's not wrong to be like that. To support a partner in the workspace, to give off some time and say, no, instead of me going to do that, I will allow my partner to go so that, you know, the organization is able to grow evenly. Does not make you a weak man. It makes you a strong man who's able to understand that we can change the trajectory of our economy in this country. When we allow all of us to participate, it will improve our GDP outcomes. Indeed. That's All right. about EQ. Marilette? You know, I think companies really are the people that should come to the center of this. We spend more time in the workplace than we spend in our homes. Yeah. So the education should be done by companies, where companies need to make sure that not only do they talk about equality, but they actually practice it. I'll tell you an example of what I, I once observed in a boardroom where there was a group of executives with only one woman in the, in, the, in, the, in the boardroom. And people brought in tea into the boardroom and left. And they expected the woman to get up and, and oh, make the tea. Mm. So it starts with us mm. as the leaders, the male leaders, to actually lead by example mm. and make sure we, we walk the talk. Yeah. But educating programs in the workspace, respecting women, respecting is the first one to respect women, once you can understand that what it takes to respect a woman, what it means to respect a woman, learn from women what respect means for them, that starts with that. Once we can achieve that, then we're on our way to making sure that uh, we, are, we conquer this. Indeed. I think we've been having the right conversations and ensuring that we cultivate the elements that need to be groomed a lot better, ensuring that there is respect overall for humanity and for women in the workplace, understanding that we need to have the right conversations with our male counterparts, starting at home and shifting the status quo in terms of what we've been culturalized to understand and society's views. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause to my panelists for joining us on stage and sharing some of their insight. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was lovely chatting to you. Thank you so much, Mafake.